Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Doomer Optimism. I am here with Ari. Um, Ari emailed me um, a while back, maybe a few weeks back, um, just suggesting, he's been a fan of the podcast, just suggesting some, some topics that he'd be interested in exploring potentially as a host. Um, so he and I took a call. We talked a little bit about, you know, the kinds of things he was interested in, super aligned with Doomer Optimism, some ideas for episodes. Um, and so I said, you know, kind of keeping in keeping with um, something Donald did recently, which is he had a friend who is a fan of the pod, a, a, a neighbor, interview him as a host. Um, and so we're kind of flipping the microphone around a little bit um, in a couple of these episodes. And so I thought, OK, let's talk a little bit about um, the kinds of things Ari's interested in, but maybe at the same time we could talk about um, or he could be, you know, somewhat interviewing me as well on these topics and we could have a conversation. Um, so that's, you know, basically the theme of this episode. We're going to just talk about a couple of these topics. Specifically, we're interested in, um, you know, the history of science, ways of knowing, uh, you know, Gertian science was something we talked a little bit about um, in our first initial conversation. So um, hopefully we can talk about some of those things, those themes, and, you know, just discuss them because I don't think I, this is a kind of thing that underlies my thinking on a lot of different topics, but I don't, um, I haven't, I haven't really discussed it long form, you know, explicitly, mm. um, at least from my perspective, I've, it, it's influenced a lot of my, my thinking, um, or my questions to other people, but I haven't really had an opportunity to talk about these things long form. So I welcome that opportunity. Um, I welcome Ari here to do more optimism. I'm, grateful that you reached out. And then um, maybe we could get started. We could just do a brief bio um, and then maybe just talk about what drew you to uh, the podcast at first. Sure. Uh, I'm just going to, uh, well, first, hello, everybody. Hi, Ashley. Uh, I'm going to make just a couple of visual notes because my short-term memory is not always so hot here. Um, but bio and then what drew me in. Um, so as Ashley mentioned my name's Ari hello internet world although right now it's just you and I witnessing this conversation uh, I'm really stoked that we're here together and that there's something new for us to explore together and for you when you mentioned that epistemology was something that you haven't sort of spoken directly about in the context of a doomer optimism episode or perhaps in like another interview context. I know you were sort of in some other different podcasts out there that I've, mm -hmm. I've come across as well. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's exciting. Um, a little bit about me. I'm, I'm a, for anyone that is visually impaired, I'm a white male in my mid thirties. I'm wearing a flannel shirt today. I've got like medium, short, medium brown hair. And I, I uh, have mostly a background in painting and sort of being interested in various forms of like creative expression, primarily like visual creative expression. And I think I'll leave it at that. Yeah, good. Uh, so, but, yeah, and then maybe about what what initially drew you to Doomer Optimism and what kept you coming back? <laughs> because I think yeah. a part of it, part of the podcast is really funny and a little unique is that there's so many different themes we explore and the different hosts uh, you know explore these different themes um and so i never know what's gonna draw somebody in or what's gonna keep them coming back so it's it's interesting to hear from a fan so i'd be yeah curious to know <clears throat> pardon me the <clears throat> took okay. a sip the wrong way we could we could cut yeah. this out if you want to take okay. a second to just drink some water <laughs> and I hate that. That happened to me on a recent podcast I did a recording of. I, I, my, so we'll cut this out, but my dog. Um, no, I love it. I, 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 this is real doom or optimism. Yeah, to me. totally. My dog went running uh, in the yard chasing the next door neighbor's dog. And then I'm like, hold on a second. So then I'm like running after the dog, <laughs> taking the dog in. And I'm like, I'm like running back up the stairs and I'm like panting. And then I like take a sip of water and like start choking. I'm like, oh my God. This is a disaster, and I didn't even. I, hopefully, he cuts out the uh, the part of me running after the dog, but it was funny. Yeah, um, it's the perfect icebreaker. Um, so yeah, what what got me into it? 
I think um, is I have this brother that's sort of always been following this thread, which I'll just call like uh, the problem with like neo um, neo capitalism or neoclassical capitalism. Like, but and so he my relationship with him has always brought me into somewhat of like contact with this sort of like larger or alternative perspective on modernity uh but it had only been i think maybe in the last like six months or a year that we would share like podcast mm. episodes so i think originally it was like the great simplification with nate hagan's mm -hmm. uh, i'm not sure if you're familiar yeah, with I'm familiar, that yep. okay um which i see as sort of having like a sort of a parallel thread in some ways with with this podcast um and i think it was through that podcast that i then heard about doomer optimism just mm -hmm. through the internet linkage and then um i i didn't go through my youtube history about like which ones oh i totally just remembered now okay so you know krista decker right um yes yes episode 203 i believe yeah um, he, he's in my notes here um it's I don't either two or... think I hosted that one, did I? And I um, else did. uh Krista Decker and the Alexis Ziegler, they're like back to back. I can't remember if it was you or not. Uh no, okay, so no, this was Josh, uh Josh and Simon. Yeah, yep. Yeah. I remember low tech magazine so, yeah. and then yeah um and then this other living energy farm one um that one I did host and those are really interesting and I think like a lot I think that that we've kind of cornered the market on low tech luddite <laughs> stuff you know or like not just necessarily low tech but appropriate tech experimentation that's happening on the margins with especially, especially energy but other um other kinds of technology and so for sure that's that's a theme i'm really proud of because i don't really think like well first of all not, not that you asked this but just reflecting on yeah. what you um are saying i think what what um differentiates us from something like the great simplification i think i think there's a lot of podcasts out there who are very very good at rehashing the doom rehashing the macro level like historical material analysis of like what period of time are we in what is the crisis of meaning what what is the energy crisis what's the environment crisis and like basically just talking at a high level about crisis i think as a listener that's very appealing because it kind of it kind of appeals to both our lizard brain and our frontal lobe <laughs> where where you feel like you're getting the high level analysis of what's coming. Um, but then I think people keep coming back to that kind of content because it does activate this sort of like fear sensation. And this is a this is, I think, what most of my academic training is in that kind of like, you know, sociological, historical material analysis. You know, you're trying to understand this the 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 period we're in, the Anthropocene, you know, these kinds of things. And people think like, oh, this is so great. It's so smart. But um, what differentiates us, and I think probably makes us a very small and niche podcast, is we are actually interested in um, what are the hard answers to the questions raised by those kinds of conversations? Like, what do you actually do in the face of this? What are people actually doing? And it seems a little weird and niche, like, low tech magazine or what's happening on living energy farm, which is like this very niche, very far end of the <laughs> bell curve, like in terms of adaptation, um, energy systems, that kind of thing. But um, so I think it's, it seems niche, but in, in our heads, it's like, we should be all be trying to wrap our heads around like what, what might these things, these different um, experimentations and adaptations people are doing what might those teach us about what we need to do in the face of all this, you know, all these crises. So um, that's interesting that you picked up on those ones. They were the, they were the gateway drug, so to speak. Mm. Um, and then it probably was uh, the diversity of the episodes that kept me 
intrigued and even like when they started branching out into like the literary corner the literary hour i can't remember how it's yeah yeah the titled the now i was like wow this counts as like a doomer optimism <laughs> episode but then you know like I love like even the playful titling of like the Doomer Optimism of Anna Karenina. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> yeah. And, that... and it's, well, it's such like the theme is so infinitely malleable because it's literally just in all of human history, you have this tension between like death and life between like crisis and response, you know? And so um, it's been nice. We didn't even intend this, but it's been nice because it really, the concept maps onto a lot of things. I feel like a lot of podcasts can get very repetitive and you're kind of saying the same things over and over again. But if you instead take this like concept as a lens and then apply it to a bunch of different parts of life, like all of, you know, all of human experience, you can apply this concept to and try to think about, you know, Doomer optimism that that lens through literature, through art, through you know energy systems. Then it's um, it, it seems to be infinitely malleable, and it's been really joyful to explore. I would say to maybe uh, take your point and drop back into the the episodes um, on my list of I have like fifteen episodes that I made some bullet points about, mm. and then. I think in there uh, is episode 100, which is you and Jason talking mm. about your reflections on Doomer Optimism, which is kind of incredible now that this is 200 and like 25 ish area. Yeah. Um, and so um, even though I, I do want to share more about sort of what else has resonated for me in it, um, just thinking about for you as like a host to know that that episode was as so long ago and you're still continuing to do it and and enjoying it um, is, I think, just fascinating because I like if you're not in it yourself, I think that like then somehow kind of like becomes part of the overall like environment of the podcast. So mm -hmm. I just think it's cool that things can evolve, and especially like you know you've mentioned in many episodes about like that doomer optimism is this sort of evolving continuum of like different kinds of exploration. Um, which I think has kind of helped me understand a little bit about myself, about like I, what I love about life, what I think is so fascinating about life is the, like the potential for newness, like every day and at like every, whatever time period you want to consider. And that that's also something that can be actively um, engaged with and that like one can push oneself into that kind of like relationship with the world and with like different areas of inquiry or just however you want to kind of go with like multi-directionality. Um, yeah, I, I would just say to that, like um, something that really is really important to both Jason and I is that that we don't turn this into something that's monetized and therefore are like really like struggling to always increase numbers because then that can really make weird incentives. And then, so it's just like a, 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 a joyful project, a project of, you know, a passion um, and love for love of the game. Um, but I also think there's two other things that are really, really important to us and they're related. One is that um, there's just an openness and like a good faith effort or good faith approach. Like I'm open to talking to somebody who's different from me and open to any of the things that they're saying is potentially true and open to like sort of just discussing from first principles, whether or not what they're saying resonates or where it is the same, where it, you know, coincides and where it's different. Like, and the other part of that is, you know, just talking across difference and modeling talking across difference. So like being open to any possible idea being true and talking to people who are different from you are like the two things I feel like, almost nobody in the whole world is trying to actively model, you know, everyone wants to just be in their little niche. And so for me, the, the openness is the, is the point, you know, and I really, really dislike um, pigeonholing people and saying like, you're not on my team and that kind of like behavior. And uh, I just, I can't, I really, that's the one thing, the one thing I'm intolerant of is the mm. that kind of pigeonholing and like you know you're on this team you're on this team and therefore you're you're bad or you're deplorable or you know that kind of stuff like it's just such a it's just it's it's a 
uh, thought terminating cliche to call people these names. And then you're just like, well, it's literally thought terminating. You can't really discuss beyond being called a deplorable. You know what I mean? There's just, it makes the conversation impossible to be really open to, you know, some potentially like mutually shared um, insights that you weren't expecting. I think a lot of it too is like a control issue. Like people want to go into a conversation with complete control and knowing that the other person is on their team in a very narrow way of thinking. And then therefore they can control what, what they let into their sphere of influence. And I'm just like, why do you need so much control? If you, if you feel confident in your perspective and your moral compass, like why do you need to have so much control? You should be able to, you know, fight off um, disagreement, you know, politely, if you, if you feel confident in your perspective. So anyways, yeah, that that's, Something I haven't really said, I don't think too explicitly before, but it's really, really important to me. And it's increasingly important. I mean, I think throughout the whole course of the podcast, people have come after us like, what are you? And you need to pick something. And, you know, <laughs> and like, and like, oh, the, you let these bad people on. You let these bad people on, like from the opposite ends. And like, I just... I'm, I really just can't abide that. If any, that's like the one thing I just am super militant about. I just, I just mm -hmm. cannot abide the name calling stuff. It's like paradox, paradoxical militants about openness. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like totally. Or that. intolerance <laughs> of intolerance kind of thing. Just like, <laughs> I just can't, I really can't. It's just, it's not that I'm like, they're a deplorable. It's just that I don't, it's not fruitful. It's just a completely not fruitful use of my time to sit and talk, to call people names. You know, it's just a complete waste of my time. People can do whatever they want with their time, but I'm just not going to, I'm personally not going to do that. Um, I'm digging it. It's making me think of, of uh, a lot of things. Um, one of which is I, I thought I might circle back to some of these episodes just to kind of a like re-highlight what the diversity sort of resonated for me in the episodes um but but briefly wanted to connect to uh, what you had said about this sort of um limitation of like encapsulating people into like categories and that we had mentioned epistemology as sort of like a theme potential theme and even there in that description that you had that that really like resonated for me as there's a kind of what i would call like um misguided epistemology of like premature or prematurely or ever like putting someone into some kind of category that mm -hmm. then prevents like further like connection with that person um which you know i this makes me really wish that i had read uh ian mcgillchrist's book uh, the matter with things or the the master and the emissary beforehand because i feel like that's something that really does map into this whole thing he's talking about with like left brainedness where you just want you know everything to be into like a category that's like predictable and controllable because it yeah. feels kind of good yeah yeah i um, would say this totally lines up with my whole resistance of spreadsheet brain more generally because like <laughs> the spreadsheets also apply to humans i mean it's our desire to categorize and put into boxes so as to dismiss um we can dismiss um the whole person or a whole you know way it, a way of thinking because it has been asked and answered by the spreadsheet so you know, this person is this, you know, this person is a deplorable and therefore it's, we're, we're done. You know, they're, they're not salvageable. There's no redemption. There's no nuance. There's no context to understanding how they came to the position that they came to. It's just, you're, you're out. Um, and this other person is in. Um, and I think the same thing is true with all this kind of like desire to control these many different what do feel like very chaotic aspects of modern life. And I can understand people's desire to want to control because it's, it is like, it is so chaotic and it is, it does feel like, man, you just start down a rabbit hole of like, let's just take healthy food, for example, as a mom, oh my gosh, I have kids. I want to feed them healthy food. And then you just start looking into like, 
wait, what are, what are the chemicals in this? And what, why, you know, you're reading the labels, like, do I have to have a chemistry degree to like feed my kids? And then, well, then what about laundry detergent? And then what about, you know, and then it just starts this rabbit hole. So you feel like it is very, very chaotic to navigate um, just modern life and the feeling of risk. That's like a big um, theme in this one sociologist, Ulrich Beck's work. Um, it's just risk, like the feeling of risk in, in modern life and this like desire to control. But then I think on the other hand, if you go something like veganism is a way in which people have have decided based on spreadsheets that they're they have control over their bodies and what is um good and bad same with good and bad people good and bad food and it's just easier in their head there's there's a good moral person in food and there's a bad moral person in food and it's just easy to make these dualistic categories and say you know because i have this heuristic that is then I'm able to navigate modern life better, but it's totally related. I mean, it's the same kind of impetus to try to control everything in, you know, the, the, who are good and bad people and what are good and bad actions based on, you know, some strict categorization that might be missing a lot of nuance, you know, like there's, there's an alternative way to do this and you have to proceed with a little bit of caution and, intuition and like the ability to think in context but so it's a little bit riskier and harder to navigate but it's more true <laughs> and that's what we were talking about before mm. with epistemology it it is more true in my opinion to understand people or systems or foods or whatever in their holistic and nuanced context rather than there's good and bad categories and i've made that decision and you know we're we're done there, you know. One hundred percent. It's. Um, I wish this conversation happened just as a matter of like daily, whatever interaction. Reminder. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Um, like whatever the temptation is, because. Um, um, yeah. It. You're talking about risk. Like there's like it even just the there's a lot to engage with and i i think personally i feel that like they're ha like trying to find this boundary of like maintaining self-care with with also uh like trying to do this sort of wanting to really understand things even if they're like way more complex than i really wanted to engage with them <laughs> yeah. at that level and i'm just yeah, like well right. this is stupid because i'm tired or like this is hurting because now i don't know what to do with my life or yeah yeah whatever struggle comes up um but it, it also satisfies this sort of instinctual part of me that like when things are when i'm like either communicating in a false with myself or the the world is sort of communicating to me like a narrative that's overly simplified there's like a bullshit alarm that's like well this is totally not trustworthy then because there's some guaranteed baked in like misreading of of reality so it's like yeah definitely a pick your poison kind of feeling at least for me but ultimately like the the sort of like what i consider inside i call it the internal uh, eternal mystery exploration or something along those lines like yeah feels like more generative in the long run yeah. Um, yeah. And I, I would say that's that's definitely like you said earlier, to me, it's kind of the point of life is to just keep asking these questions and answering them as you as you walk your path forward in life. You know what I mean? It's just like sometimes I think a lot of times people want answers right away. And so then they'll kind of pick up, pick anything that like seems somewhat right and then stick with it as opposed to living with the mystery of not knowing i think that's part of part of our culture too is you want to just have like let's say politics right now you want to have like an answer you want to have a hot take you want to you know you want somebody to tell you the right way to the right way to think about this what's happening and then you just want to stick with that like you know and and you want to sort of be told because it's it lowers the chaos but I mean, like right now, there's so much unfolding, you can just kind of live with the question, like observe it, observe your interaction, with, observe your reaction to it and just keep living with the question. Like, well, I guess we'll see. Um, God, there's this, uh, there's this like 
Chinese parable. I think, I don't know, it was at the end of Charlie Wilson's War, this movie with uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman. And it's, you know, it's it's like, what what will happen in this? There's a story like, oh, this guy breaks his leg. Oh, and then everybody's so oh, how horrible. He says, oh, we'll see. But then he got out of some, you know, having to go to war because his leg was broken. It's like, oh, how wonderful. And he's like, oh, we'll see. You know, you don't really know the full end of the story until it plays out. So like just being able to live with the question is, I think is a huge part of it too. Um, yeah. Mm. Oh, and oh, one other thing I wanted to say while you were talking that I'm just reminded of. Yeah. There's, a, there's another impulse not only to know the answer, but also to answer every question through um, thinking instead of doing. And so that's another thing that's really big in my, at least my life experience is like going out and actually talking to people, talking to people on this podcast is a form of doing for me um, because you're talking to people who are different. You're navigating those tensions, the differences, but then also like literally just going out and having a garden. I lived on nine acres. I learned a lot about like land management and rural life um, being a mother, just like going out and I'm like getting involved in my kid's school and observing the world and doing actual things can also answer a lot of questions that cannot simply be answered by sitting in your room, like writing essays or like thinking through forms of logic or something, you know, like I just... There is, and this this ties into the Gertian science, which maybe we can just like bring this up now because it's... um. It's something I never really talked about in depth on the podcast, but it's something that um, I think it was Stone Age Herbalist in on Twitter who um, who kind of flagged this whole perspective for me, which I didn't really even know existed until a couple of years ago. But um, the idea being, you want to uh, understand things in context, and a lot of times that means experience. And so, for me, I think about like. When I went moved rural in Uruguay for seven years, I started to learn about the ways in which at least the Uruguayan farmers who a lot of times had cattle, the way in which they interacted with their land over time. Um, and so what they would do is they would observe the land, they would observe the animals, they would be observing what kinds of plants were popping up, um, observing how the water and rain rainwater fell on the property where it moved to. Um, and all of these things are kind of embedded in this person, this, this longitudinal observation in ways, much of it is in information that wouldn't be possible to really put in a spreadsheet. It would not be possible to really put a number on it. And so there's a kind of thinking that's that's like qualitative and intuitive that exists within a person, especially like in relationship over time, um, that is totally different than the kind of information that comes about when you have, you know, this many liters of water fell over this period of time and, you know, this much soil erosion, but then, you know, there's just like, you're only measuring a few things and you're taking them out of context. And that gives you some information, but that information is lacking the holistic context and you just need to treat it as such. But everybody now, basically in the modern era, thinks that the measured thing is the thing, but it's not. It's taken totally out of context of the thing. You know, it. What the measured thing is, is how many liters of water fell. It's not the whole system of how the grazing animal works in re in reaction or in relationship with the farmer and, and the landscape and the culture and, you know, all of this kind of stuff. And so, um, I don't know, maybe you want to talk a little bit about Gertian science yeah. and what you learned about it. There's, um, there's there's two things I would love to speak to. One is uh, tying back to what you said about like learning by doing, which I think still will connect to, to Gertian science. Um, and I believe I'm just looking up at my notes here about um, there was a panel um, with the person that does like the Center for Humane Technology and Jonathan Rawson and I think Jason. Uh, Cognizor and um, the and 
I believe, and then you, I think I might be mixing. Sometimes I get the yeah, ones no. mixed up, but, um, and you, you had talked about like planting potatoes as they, they became yes. this whole theme of this episode about like the difference between going out there and planting potatoes and having all of your thoughts about the planting and, and getting the feedback from the, the potatoes growing in the soil and what goes right and what goes wrong and what permutations happen of living, growing things versus, you know, being in your uh your spreadsheet modeler world and describing like the the chemical interactions of potato cells with soil yes. you know molecules or or whatever um yeah, yeah. that i i loved both just the the practicality of it that like kind of again going to this low tech theme of like man almost anybody can plant a potato so you don't have to whatever have huge financial backing or whatever to like even begin to do any of this kind of like curiosity about like what is the difference between like knowing when i do something versus knowing when i speak about something and are there ratios that one would want to consider or is it best to be talking about potatoes when growing potatoes etc <laughs> right. yeah. um that all of these fun questions that can be opened up um so i just wanted to link back to that i believe it's um Looking at my notes, it's episode 41, Future Fossils Crossover Event. Oh, yeah, um, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, there was actually a whole rant in the middle of that about a, a UFO encounter, which I thought yeah, was, there was a... <laughs> crazy. That was fun. But yeah, and then, but then, um, but yeah, that was, a, that was a cool, because that group um, is kind of like Jason's milieu, which he came out of, he had a podcast before Doomer Optimism, which was called Both And, and... These are like the, it's kind of like a little bit game B adjacent Jim Rutt, a little bit intellectual dark web, like Brett Weinstein is in this circle. Like there's, you know, Jonathan Rousen and all these um, different guys. Um, and they are big into thinkers. And I, you know, I call them the big, the big brains, the galaxy brains, and they're great at thinking and they're very fun to listen to. And a lot of times they're, um, the kinds of things they're talking about are like, are like very um, into the front, frontal lobe engaging. Like, you know, let's think about this topic. Let's think about like, you know, what what is virtue or like, what is the meaning crisis? What is religion actually? Or, you know, those kinds of questions. And, and it's very fun to listen to, but then I think at a certain point it does become a little bit like intellectual masturbation. Like you just need to just, <laughs> to, like the people say touch grass. Like you just <laughs> need to, do anything practical and you will be able to speak more fluently and maybe even more directly. Um, I, I got into a, a Twitter fight one night, like a couple weeks ago, um, sitting at the park, watching my kids play um, with vegans. And it was so frustrating because they were using this language, really high level language to um, to kind of tr try to make the conversation on their terms, which was like formal logic. And I was like, I refuse to engage in this conversation using formal logic terms because formal logic is something that a small number of PhDs in philosophy know how to do. And I'm not going to learn how to do it just to be able to talk to you about veganism. Bring the language down and make it intelligible, or we're not going to have this discussion. And and like to me, it's almost like a like a class thing. Like if you can't make your argument in in popularly intelligible terms, you are not smart. I'm sorry. If you think you're very smart, you need to be able to make your point in ways that even a bus driver can understand. Anyone who is not trained in this high level, like academic jargon should be able to understand. And I've thought that for a very long time. And I think a lot of academics um, can, can try to hide behind language and jargon as a way to not have their thoughts, um, you know, criticized as much or make their thoughts sound more fancy than they really are. Um, and so that ties into it too with the doing, because it's like, it sounds kind of stupid in some ways, like sometimes Jason and I were saying like, how many pod, how many podcast episodes can we have if your like eventual point is literally just go plant 
potatoes and see yeah. what happens. Um, but <laughs> apparently a lot over 200. Um, but you know, the <laughs> ultimate point is to interact with those two different worlds, like be able to talk, be able to plant the potatoes, observe, see what's going on, like be present with your children and observe them, you know, be present in your community, observe what's going on there. But then you can also talk about it, but it's got to be the right like mix of doing and thinking. It can't just be one extreme or the other. Yeah. Um, and that I've noticed that in more recent episodes that there has, well, in episode 100, your your reflections with with Jason episode, there was a discussion about the focus of the podcast intentionally moving towards like what what experiments are happening. Mm -hmm. um, and I, there is a part of me that like, uh, I think resisted that because of this kind of like frontal lobe fascination thing that you're talking about that like there is a kind of like high that comes from like I just want to like get the whole system in my head at once and it yes. feels so good uh, like I'm the commander analysis. of the universe oh, yes. uh, yeah. but but then there's another part of me is like yeah like it's I also feel like okay it's now I can come back to like embracing my limitations in a way that's more authentic to like my limitations as an embodied person living in like a particular time and space in a tiny little city, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah. yeah. So, Goethe, who was he? Uh, <laughs> he was a man. He, um, I'm going to just do a brief bio from some notes here. He, for anyone who, who is not familiar with Goethe, um, here's another person to know about in the world in history. Uh, he was alive from about 1750-ish to 1850-ish. Um, his he uh wikipedia describes him as a polymath um which is a person who like does a lot of things uh including writing but also um like natural science um his sort of an initial awesome thing that he did or what got him well known was publishing this book called sorrows of young werther which happened at age 25 and that sort of projected him into uh, nobility in the noble class but also kind of like opened up different avenues for him to be involved with all these like high level like projects in um, in the government in Weimar um, and um, so that sort of then the the, uh, the ennobling that happened this was in 1782 so it, it is some time after the the publishing of that book. Um, but um, through that opportunity, uh, Goethe is like in the government, he's like overseeing all these different kinds of uh, projects, which are super diverse um, things with like plays, and I think like designing mechanical gardens, I like stewarding like different, some kinds of like building processes or something, um, but just really like diverse. And then later he absconds to Italy to just totally kind of get away from everything where he's like not really known there and gets like really into like phenomenology uh, both like in studying plants but also like doing these like observations of like color and light um, and I should probably briefly mention that all of this is sort of filtered through or not filtered through but is like um, befriended by his like poetical sense or that it, if you kind of learn about Goethe, like there seems to be this kind of like continuous thread that there's always this like sense towards the poetical in a way that he like really seems passionate about tying into like every other avenue of his life, including like science and observation and whatever else kind of like hard real stuff that is considered like true science. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I don't want to I don't want to like run through the whole thing, but I, I want to just kind of finish by by sharing a quotation that I had found that comes from, I think, like an aesthetic champion of his. And um, this person, I'm now don't think I wrote down the name. It starts with an H um, and maybe I'll put that in the show notes. It says, um, the human being knows himself only in so far as he knows the world. He perceives the world only in himself and himself only in the world. Every new object clearly seen opens up a new organ of perception in us. And mm. um, for me, that was kind of like the, 
the clincher. I'd never heard about Goethe before, um, other than like it was a name that I knew. Uh, that was really about it. But um, your your invitation to learn about this person was sort of a fascinating thriller for me, and that that quote really like was the clincher. Um, in terms of like, what is this sort of, uh, can I take this person seriously and engage with their ideas seriously at the same time, like simultaneously feeling like very jazzed and like mm -hmm. called to this kind of like, yes, it's okay to like have big, deep feelings about the world and to feel that like poetry is intermingled with like the physical processes of the world and that these that it can be a sincere like interest in combining and i think probably to take it one step further that there that those things are like uh inextricably interlinked and that like you don't have to you can kind of ascribe whatever word you want to call it i like to say that the world like there is some like legitimate magic in the world or there's some legitimate mystery that cannot be fully modeled you know, even if you turned the whole, you know, all of the matter in the universe into like a simulator that the simulator would not account for just this other component that is beyond sort of mathematical computation. Yeah. Yeah. I would just say like, I'm not a Goethe scholar or anything, but, you know, just was drawn into this idea a couple of years ago. Um, so yeah, actually, while the we're recording. If there are any Goethe scholars out there that want to come on the podcast, me and uh, Ari will uh, will host you. But um, yeah, because it would be really interesting to hear to really like dig down into the philosophy and life and like maybe even life experiences that led him to take this turn. But you know, I think that there are just so few um, modern individuals, philosophers, and thinkers who resist what I would think of as like the siren song of the spreadsheets, like the spreadsheets, the, the, um, the, the draw of control, the, or the illusion of control that comes with a certain kind of rationalistic thinking is I think one of the fundamental challenges that people face in their thinking with modernity. And so the, as modernity is coming out, and all of these things are changing so rapidly and there's so much science and technology, um, you can see the appeal of sort of worshiping um, rationalism and worshiping the human brain and worshiping, um, you know, I mean, like as I was coming up and as a young adult, just like this kind of philosopher saying things like, the human brain is the best, most complex thing that's ever existed in the universe kind of stuff. It's just like, how narcissistic can like a one animal be, you know, like it's so <laughs> hubristic to just think like our brains are themselves like an object of worship. Um, and then it just becomes, it's a really slippery slope to just like, I want to control everything. I want to measure everything. And like, you can, I, once I started learning about like the history of science like this, you can even walk through um, like a, an art museum that has, art from the middle ages to the modern era. And you can see it in, in art, like this desire to sort of control um, and measure everything. It, it's like versus a life sort of imbued with, um, with lots of, I would say, mystical explanations of phenomena of the universe. And so of course the rational part is, is good too in its place. It has, it gives us a way of knowing answers to questions that before we didn't have the tools to answer. So that's, that's good. But if you go so far in that direction, people are losing all of the mysticism and then they're just reinventing new, totally absurd mystical <laughs> points of view from the, like the science and rationalistic point point. So um, I love the idea that Goethe sort of resisted that impulse. And I think in favor of the poetic in favor of the holistic, the in the context space, the unity of man and nature, um, the way to understand nature is in the context of it. And so like, I mean, this has practical implications. This isn't just like a philosophical exercise. I mean, we think about um, going back to this example of farmers in Uruguay, 
Um, I know a lot of agroecological farmers who have a completely holistic approach to understanding their land, the way that they approach their animals. It's totally humane. Um, they're, they're building out biodiversity on their little tiny plots of land by, through their agroecological practices, all of this. And people from the global north are coming in. It doesn't even have to be Uruguayan farmers. It's happening in the United States, too. People who, who live in cities whose job is to write policy, who work on spreadsheets, will come in and are upending these people's livelihood. And so these are there are real consequences to these ways of thinking. If you go super far in the direction of, of obsessing about and worshiping rationality and quantitative measurement, those are the kinds of people who live in cities and write policy. Those, those, that's the way they think. I've been in these rooms. I'm, I'm pl around a plenty of environmentalists. I know what they're thinking. And then the people who live on the land who understand things through the lens of like nature and holistic and longitudinal qualitative understandings of their land, um, that's not a valid way of knowing. It's considered an invalid perspective. It's not, it's anecdotal. It's invalid. There's no peer review about it. Um, Alan Savory's got a famous little rant on this. He's a he's like the father of regenerative agriculture, and he's like, people will let these PhDs will literally come out on the land and see something, observe it, and say the opposite is happening because it doesn't fit with their models and their spreadsheets. Like they literally have trained their eyes to not be able to see. Um, and so, yeah, I, I'm pretty passionate about this because I think there's also like there's a qualitative and class based thing going on here, which is um, if you go in the direction of rationality and measurement of everything, oftentimes you are a higher class, you're more educated, you have more power. And so then it becomes like, well, anyone who's smart knows that this is the right way to know things. And if you don't know things in the way I know things, you're dumb and backwards and living in the past. And therefore your whole way of knowing and whole livelihood can be sort of disregarded because you know, we have the right way of knowing here. It's here on the spreadsheet. It's been, the questions have been asked and answered and there's like real world implications for this. And it gets me really <laughs> riled up and, and like upset because hmm. I think yeah. there's very few people I think who have been enough in the world of spreadsheets to know the limitations of them. You know what I mean? And so I think a lot of people, they have an intuitive sense that there is something um, out of touch about them, but there's not a, uh, they don't have enough experience actually looking into like how things are measured to make a educated analysis. Like I have my PhD. I know exactly how these models are written. I've looked into some of them in great depth, especially the ones regard with regard to agriculture. And I know that the emperor has no clothes, so I can speak definitively on it. If a farmer comes in and says, like, these spreadsheets are stupid, they'll just say, oh, yeah, you know, you're backwards. You don't know anything because you're not educated. And so there's very few people in my position who are like, see this and then are willing to talk about it, I think, like publicly. So anyways, that's my little passion, passionate rant on the topic. So you would identify like a, a component of like courage then and that sort of like, um, wanting to stand at like a juncture point between sort of both groups or I'm not sure how you'd want to describe yeah, it. I mean, but the... I think, yeah, I think part of it is I have this kind of old school lefty orientation of like power and analysis of power. And like, if you have power to use it for moral good um, and the way that I see it. And so I, like the, I don't mean to be like I'm on some righteous, you know, rant or whatever, like that I'm better than anyone else or anything like that. I just don't see a world in which I, I know these things are happening. I see that it's unequal. I've been in rooms where policymakers are talking about like third world countries, you know, developing countries and people who are doing like, um, you know, subsistence and unregulated food trading and they're saying how can we force these people to get on the books so that we can tax them and they're just saying that with a straight face like it's an unequivocal good <laughs> to 
put all of these people's informal livelihood and interactions on the books so that they can be controlled and taxed and so that it all can be measured for who, you know, for what end. And so to me, like, I can't sit in a room like that and not say something like and question that the logic behind it. But I mean, so many people, they really are just, they don't, it's not like they're, a lot of it is not malice, really. A lot of it is just lack of experience. And so all I can do is really speak to my own experience and like the whole, (laughs) the conclusions I've come to living my life thus far, you know? And so I, I see these differences, but you know, not that I'm like some moral crusader or anything. I just, I don't, I don't live in a world in which I can see those things and not say something about it, you know? And luckily I I did, I went, I didn't go in academia for a reason. I want to be able to speak honestly. And I think there's a lot of incentives for a lot of careers where people are not able to speak honestly, because it would cause some sort of comeuppance for them, you know, professionally. Um, I hope you'll forgive a little bit of a non sequitur, but just kind of going back to like what I cherished, I guess, about Doomer Optimism was that, um, implicitly uh, throughout my sort of probably into my thirties and even kind of after that, um, there is this, um, sort of like secret desire that like, oh, if I... If I just had a PhD, like then everything would be right, or like I would be valid, or I would like what I had a lot of ideas about like the PhD is like the pinnacle of um achievement. I know, in, yeah, achievement yeah. or interfacing with the world, or it's like it has this really special like status for me. And then I like heard Doomer Optimism and I heard like both you and Jason like talking about like the the like the myriad kind of like limitations academia and limitations yeah Yeah. and it honestly i think it saved me like maybe 10 years or however many years of my life i like in a way that i feel like wow i like maybe i'm starting to be able to let go of this sort of like here's the trajectory for knowledge or here's the trajectory for truth or like here's like the definitive way to like make a difference in the world um Mm -hmm. etc etc um that's so that's it, great. I like that. I'm glad that you um, had that ability to self reflect. I would say for sure, um, a lot of people the credentialism is just as bad as a spreadsheet brain in some things. Like you know, I went to to school. No offense to my colleagues, but like with people who are just really good at crunching numbers and writing papers and putting their head down and kind of saying what is saying what is um expected to be said you know so it's like you learn what the party line is in sociology and you do your research and basically what you're doing is you say you know blah 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 phenomenon is happening with women now i'm going to apply that to hispanics and so blah 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 phenomenon is happening with hispanics and you just that's what you go along you do your whole career and you just talk about this little phenomenon with little incremental steps and you're not necessarily not saying that all sociologists aren't like um, doing good work, but there's just a lot of people who have their PhD who are just doing incremental kind of paper pushing stuff, you know, and I've seen enough of the inside of these peer review processes. You're not really allowed to say anything of great substance. You know, you're able to say maybe one or two very small insights, but it's very narrow um, because there's, there is a total group thing happening that's not necessarily peer review in the sense of being open, um, to new discoveries, but in, in the sense of peer review being, this is the party line in how we're supposed to think. And if you fit into that party line and you're, you're good to get published, you know, that kind of thing. So, you know, to me, independent inquiry is the way to go, you know, just find something you're passionate about and keep learning about it and get involved in it in the real world and, um, and see what not only get involved, but like, if you're passionate enough, and you've learned enough about the topic, see what difference you can make in it too. do something where you can like, shift some window towards the world you want to see, you know. Um, So yeah, I'm glad you had that enough self reflection to do. To, to make that choice that was good 
put, push that over tin window a little bit. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and, and you can be more, there are so many, it's so crazy because the world is like so chaotic. You would just think it, it would make, make it so that academia would be like more open. It's less open. It's less open than even when I started um, my PhD. It's narrowing um, the the openness to real inquiry rather than expanding it, even in a chaotic, like if you're saying like the empire is collapsing, I just feel like there's so many better worlds to be in if you want to really make a difference in thinking or to push your own thinking. Like it's much better to be independent in a lot of these institutions because they're really, they're very limiting and increasingly so. I'm trying to just kind of think about which of the five possible ways to respond to that, including um, maybe tying back to another episode that that did it for me was, um, so there was this episode, I think 203 with Chris De Decker, which also I believe had Josh Kearns, if not. Yes, Josh Kearns, he's okay, great. So, it, who then I went and I listened to his episode. Oh, he's great. Uh, which is and number he's 19. Perfect. He's perfect for the um, like critique of academia stuff. He's he's really been on the inside. Yes, he uh, he had a whole th line about um, like funding comes in like um, and all of a sudden there's all these fish that you can catch in this one area of the lake and everyone sort of swarms around the the funding source where the good catch is and there's the rest of the lake to to be explored. Yes. Um, Great and, metaphor. Uh, it, it, it was wonderful hearing him kind of encapsulate that in like, you know, a few sentences and be like, oh, okay, like, thank you for helping me see the world more clearly. Mm -hmm. um, and then also that he, he did go and like have this experience of being with people in a situation where they're looking for pesticide free water um both that he had to challenge academia to do that work like honestly and that he had to like do the work in a context that was like on the ground with with those folks uh, yes. where the solution was not um you know appearance. just shoot a lot of energy into it yeah. or, or or appearance um but like how do i actually do this charcoal thing to get clean water and yep. that like the outcome of that story was that there was a tangible outcome um and he that... worked together with the people this is in thailand and and they kind of co-created in a way that he was like paying attention to what they already did and like they're this all sounds like very anthropology major but it's like following their cultural norms and meeting them where they're at and seeing like what kinds of um resources they have access to what kind of um processes are they used to kind of thing and then how can that work with like doing some little bits of experimentation to improve things, but with them rather than so often what happens with these like funding sources, they literally just invent something that has nothing to do with this people's personal like lives or culture. And then they come in, they give them this technology that's going to save the world or whatever. And it makes no sense for them culturally. The technology sits by the wayside. Nobody uses it. And of course, like, you know, the researchers walk away with millions of dollars in grant money to do this thing that was completely useless for everyone involved. And so, like, yeah, hearing um, hearing Josh Kearns talk about that stuff in the context of, like, the hard sciences, too, is really helpful, you know, because then you're just like, yeah, this is happening basically across the board. His his whole field of study or like one of them was like bio biochemistry. Um, mm -hmm. He had gone like far enough into that route in academia to like speak that language. And totally. yet it was like, well, like, but I want to do something with it. Or like, yeah. You know, <laughs> not that there's not things that are not being done in academia. It's just there's the different flavor of it that. Yeah. And I think it's I just more it, rewarded it, by. Yes. Yeah. And it's just important to understand those limitations. But, you know, you. Well, it's a, like like we said at the beginning of this episode like you know you just got to navigate the world as it is which is nuanced and complex and messy and sometimes contradictory and so you know maybe sometimes you look into academia and it is the right path and the only path like for me I got my PhD partially because 
I just know how people's psychology works. And if I have my PhD, then I get access to certain kinds of positions that I think will be like slightly cushier or slightly more comfortable or slightly more powerful than if I didn't. And so, you know, I just have, I got my PhD almost like just for, um, you know, access to those kinds of opportunities, just because that's how people think. Um, but, you know, I don't think that's the only way to get access to a lot of impactful opportunities. There's a lot of ways to navigate the world and you have to think whether or not you do want to spend 10 years of your life getting the PhD. Um, just to get Mama mia. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, maybe we should move um, just briefly to touch on this um, marketplace idea that you yeah. um, brought up before we wrap up. Um, so I don't know if you have a specific question, but I can talk a little bit about the story of it. Um. I think my specific question would be like, in what ways is this like Craigslist or not, mm -hmm. or like Facebook Marketplace or not? Yeah, um, yeah. So I'm anyone is willing is it, I, I'd be happy to to let anyone take this idea because it's totally stalled and I don't want to do it anymore. Uh, just because I don't, I just don't have. I need somebody who's not like me who has certain skills that I don't have to be able to pull this off. But there's, I'm sure that person exists, and if that person wants to take this idea and pick my brain about it, they're welcome to. So you like coding skills or like no coding, design yeah, skills coding, or coding, like somebody who would be willing to, yeah, who knows how to like build a build a build a some, some kind of software, build some kind of app, and then not only that, but like knows how to navigate the world of um funding and getting things to market and all this kind of in the tech world like i just don't i don't want to be a tech ceo <laughs> i have no interest in that and i have this idea but um i have no real interest in i thought that maybe i could pull it off and get a team together to to do something like this but i'll tell you the story of how how it ended up working out so during the pandemic um obviously i've been working in in things like sustainable food systems local food systems for since you know early in my sociological career um and i noticed right. during the pandemic there was this thing that popped up called a rico network in um northern uh europe r e k o and the way that it worked was people made these rico groups on facebook and and local farmers who had produce available, um, or or not just produce, but products, um, other kinds of food products available when there was some questions about like the global supply chain and being able to access various products at the time, they would put what they had for sale on these Facebook groups, and then people would claim them, and then it would be like an, it was like an online farmers market to this to the sense of okay, I'll take this. I'll take X, Y, and Z. They'll put their list. The farmer would mark it down. And then once a week, there would be like a pickup drop off in a parking lot somewhere. And so it would just be like, okay, I, I know I've got my food for the week because I've got this um, Rico network that I've been using. I've got this farmer who's relatively reliable. Um, so I know I can get access to this food. And I was following all of this and I was just like, you know, it would be really nice if you could do an online, totally local farmer's market where you could have the stuff picked out in advance instead of the farmer's market where you go and you're not sure what's going to be there or um or if there's going to be anything left by the time you get there you know so picking everything out in advance I, I figured it would be really easy to make a marketplace where the farmers can upload every week what products they have available and then people could just pick those products pay for them in advance through the website and then there's just a pickup drop off time now there are already versions of this um, there. And so we did a bunch of research on like the different versions of this that exist. There's like barn to door and there's, you know, a couple different things, but they, they all have kind of different um, distribution models. And for me, the idea was to try to make the distribution really streamlined. Like you're going to, it's just like a farmer's market. You're meeting in this park, this parking lot and it's going to be like Wednesdays and Saturdays or whatever. And that's, that's when the drop off happens um, and it's going to be, you know, serve this local area. And if you can make it to that drop off, you can, you can pick up from this place. And then, cause I think the distribution is actually a really big issue with local foods. Like a lot of farmers are doing their own individualized distribution. There's not really distribution models that aggregate local products. There are for like, you know, international and international. Um, but a lot of farmers are literally like hiring trucks and sending stuff out themselves and or send, shipping things via, you know, FedEx one by one or whatever. So 
Um, so that was the idea. It was, uh, it was called Lokonomy. Um, and I still have that, uh, website, <laughs> um, and it's just sitting dormant. And, and I was thinking, you know, like whatever this, th this would be the MVP, the minimum viable product where you just have like, um, this connection between you, it would be the go-to place for local products. You know, you, you, all the farmers would kind of learn farmers and even like local craft producers, like you make soap, you make alternative shampoo, you make candles, you know, you make baby clothes, you make dolls. Yeah, but as long as it's made, made yourself, you could put it up there and you sell it locally. Um, and then that would be, it, it could turn into many different things, you know, a minimum viable. It could just be like this drop off online farmer's market thing. Um, but then, you know, it could turn into like, okay, it's a festival, it's a local dinner, farm dinner that all the local producers put on a couple, you know, every quarter, it can turn into um, a little uh, cargo bike, um, cargo bike uh, distributors can pop up and be driving these things the last couple miles to get it to people's houses as opposed to the pickup at the um at the parking lot whatever that kind of thing so I just you know I just think a lot more needs to be done with local food and enabling that is is part of my overall mission in life but um I uh I applied for this big grant to try to get the thing going and get it uh written and do some MVP software um, <clears throat> with somebody who's involved in like ag an agroforestry project in Colorado. Um, and I said like, let's do, it was a big agroforestry grant. Uh, I think it was some small portion of it would go to me and then the rest of it would go to these people and we would do like a, a model on their, their Can land. Can I just clarify for, uh, yeah. so this would have been initially based out of Colorado through the, this one if, particular... if we did the grant, if we did the grant, it would have been like a Colorado based MVP, like test, you know, build the software, okay. try to get, try to um, have this part particular person's um, agroforestry land be like a hub. And then, you know, that will like, let's just test it out of there. And then I was writing this grant. I brought the grant to this person. I don't want to say who they are. Um, we're writing the grant together. And then at the last minute, he submitted the grant with all my stuff taken off of it <laughs> and it just said I think I would be more successful to get this grant if you're not on it and so I was just really like frustrated by that and just was like mm. I'm done with this I just like I, I and I don't want to do VC fun I personally don't want to do VC funding I don't like that yeah. model I don't like the idea of being beholden to exponential growth on something that I think should be linear growth um, I think that local food should be linear. It should not be exponential. If it's exponential, there's somebody being exploited, in my opinion. Um, there's just too much expectation for returns that go to investors. And you can't take that much capital out of a, out of a project and not be exploited of somewhere. Uh, not with local food. There's The margins are too small. So, uh, so anyways, I just kind of, the wind got taken out of my sails. That was like a, maybe a year and a half ago. And I just kind of haven't gotten back to it. But I still think it's something that, that probably should exist, and I would love to to help build into reality. Uh, my sort of single sentence reflection is like, oh, well, um, do you think, what will the nature of the supermarket be like at, in the next like 5, 10, 20 years? Do you, I don't want to get too kind of like out there and not too far away from this idea, but to kind of tie it back into like sort of a thing that is sort of the common like way that food basically gets distributed now. I don't know what the numbers are, but I would guess it's still pretty high. Oh, um, very high. Yeah. The, and um, not that there can't be any supermarkets, but but like, you know, introducing this kind of more like I guess you call it like direct to consumer uh, yeah. kind of like networking. Um, so you still see this as like a viable yeah, project? I think, I think basically, um, I am, I am a doomer in the sense of that. I think, I think there will be, um, in the future continued, not only, um, not only like, uh, disruptions in the global supply chain. I also think that the incentives are such for large agricultural companies and anyone basically involved in the food system to give you 
poorer quality food, just less and less good quality food that sells faster, that is like addictive and unhealthy. And so I think what will happen is that the supermarket food will just get worse and worse and worse quality over time because that's what the incentive of the marketplace is. Um, and like worse quality produce, worse quality meat, worse quality and everything packaged and processed. And at the same time, um, if you want access to good quality food, you have to go local. So then there's like a, there's a friction point in going local and finding your local farmer and then figuring out how to purchase from them and figuring out. So the, in my opinion, the whole doomer optimism thing is like a, um, you've got, uh, this is actually like in my dissertation, I write about this is dual process idea where I was just going to, yeah, as one up. system <laughs> kind of like is declining in quality or declining in meeting the needs of people. This other parallel system is kind of growing, growing in popularity. Not that it will necessarily ever overtake the other one. It doesn't even really need to he, like I, I, this guy on Twitter, Visa, he always says like 1% of people is a lot of people. <laughs> it's like, even if it's 1% of people using that, it's a huge amount of people. It doesn't have to be even over 50% to be successful. That that anyone is able to access local food that's higher quality, um, that's supporting like this regenerative economy is any amount of that is good. And so, but I just think like there is a point at which people just turn away from supermarkets just because like, oh, the quality is, is just so bad. You know, the stuff is just coming in. It's grown in the worst possible way and it's bad for my family's health. And I just like can't stand behind the systems that produce this stuff um, anymore. You know, there is like an ethical point. And I think like a lot of vegans are driven by that ethical point, but I think there's also just the health aspect. And then, you know, just um, quality and just you, like, eventually you just see the quality decline to the point where you're like, okay, I've got to make a different choice now. So it could, it could just be something that even if it remains a fringe, fringe network for yeah. that, it's still like, people I mean, are it still already getting is like a fringe. Food. I forget what percentage of food, local food um, is part of people's diet, but like anything that, that, that lowers that um, friction to be able to access that, um, I think is would be a good thing to bring into the world. Um, we have only a couple minutes left, so maybe yeah. we can wrap up. I mean, final thoughts? Um, it It's it's so much fun to be able to kind of go mul multiple places in a conversation. So I've really enjoyed that opportunity with you. Um, I. I wish that we like had a parallel universe where we could just talk about food systems because it's like a mm -hmm. dark, fascinating thing. But there's also like a locality in there that makes, I think, a higher like um, uh, like a, an easier way to actually get into like trying like being curious about making a difference and that it can happen locally um, yeah. and that maybe it can be a, a future conversation. And um, yeah. Um, yeah, and I would just I would just invite you to um, follow your interests and invite people back on um, either by yourself or I can co-host with you or you could ask one of the, the uh, other former hosts to co-host with you. I think it's really I really appreciate your your gumption sending me an email and um, and uh, proposing some episodes because those are all the themes that you suggested are all things we're interested in. It's really cool. And I, I really love the idea that this could be a platform for people to just explore things. Um, as long as it doesn't get too unwieldy, which it hasn't been lately. I think a lot of people are just kind of taking a break on stuff in the summer. So you're welcome yeah. to come back. I really appreciate you reaching out. This is really fun to kind of be on the <laughs> interview side of things. And um, yeah, so welcome into a, uh, into the fold <laughs> well gracias <laughs> yeah um, yeah and uh and this was a great conversation i really enjoyed it awesome me too um oh. well to be could be continued in cyberspace and in reality reality <laughs> and uh with our goethe informed uh consciousnesses yes. exactly awesome <laughs> all right well thanks sorry all right take care ashley all right bye